Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to welcome our guests here this morning. I'm glad that you came to worship with us. I also want to remind you that after the service we have potluck. That's right, right? Yes. Just want to make sure I'm right. Fellowship dinner. Fellowship dinner. In the room directly outside those doors. Alright, keep your Bibles open to Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Last week, we looked at chapter 2. We've gone through all of chapter 1. <clears throat> Excuse me, we looked at the days of creation. Chapter 1 dealt with days 1 through 6. Chapter 2 goes to the seventh day. And then you start to see this is the history or the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were made. And I told you last week that a lot of people will take this second chapter and say this is a totally new creation. Uh, those that try to bring together some type of evolution and creation that use this as their basis. Um, but last week I also told you to look at this clearly because what this gives you is the perspective of the creation of the heavens and the earth once God makes Adam and Eve and how they're dealing with their new environments. <coughs> chapter 1 goes with how God makes everything. Chapter 2 now focuses on the man and the woman in their environment. Right? So, I asked this last week, when did God make the Garden of Eden? What day? Sixth day. The sixth day. What day did Adam make all the, or name all the animals that were brought to him? Sixth day. That was a busy day, wasn't it? Okay. We looked at the fact that the thing that Adam could have named every species of animal that God created at the beginning in one day. No. Okay, and I will tell you that when I look at this, I will tell you no. But if you look and you read this carefully. It says that God brought the animals to Adam. Okay, was it that Adam had to go to everywhere on the earth to name these animals? But look at it specifically in chapter 2. What animals, what kinds of animals did God bring to him? And we will look and what verse would that be? Let's look at verse um, 19. It says, Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So here we go, verse 20. Adam gave names to all the what? Adam. And all the birds. And to every beast of the field. Now, why did God bring these animals to Adam? Well, you find that out verses before this, God makes this statement. He says, it's not good for the man to be alone. And so he will make him a helpmate. Reading those verses, does he make him a helpmate right after he says that? No. Look at it, because that's not a rhetorical question. Look at no. the text. Yeah. Thank you, Ray. What does he do? He shows it as need. Okay, he says it's not good for man to be alone, and then he brings all these animals for him to name. That's giving you the context of why God brought the animals to him. When God brought the animals to him, what was Adam's thoughts after he named them? He's looking around, he's looking at all these animals, and they're paired up. And he's looking, and he's going, I'm here by myself. Okay, now think about this, because this goes right back to the importance of when God makes everything after its time. You cannot bring together evolution and creationism in any way, shape, or form. Amen. Either God did it, and He did it in six literal days, or He didn't do it at all. Amen. How do we know that? Because man is above the animal creation. How do you know that? Because Adam looked around and could not find anyone comparable to him. Yeah. Think about that. Amen. What is that telling you? That means he didn't come from them. Right? right? right. Now did God just make a mistake when he 
wrote that? No. Or is he telling us that for a reason? Is God able to see the beginning from the end? Amen. So God is able to see that right at the end of earth's history, there will be controversy throughout the entire world about origins. And he would also be able to see that within his church there would be controversy about origins. And that there would be all kinds of ideas brought forth about origins. And yet from the beginning, God has never changed his story about origins. Amen. I've told you before as we've gone through this, that I can remember in school, uh, and to this day, the theories of evolution have changed drastically pretty much every decade. Okay? And what I was taught in school is not taught in school anymore when it comes to evolution. Ricky forwarded me a video, and I loved it, I watched it last night. And here's a question for those who believe in evolution. Darwinian evolution says that one kind will turn into another kind. Is that right? If given enough time. If given enough time, one kind will evolve into another kind. But I want you to show me, show me one kind that has turned into another kind. Can you do it? No. Science is predicated on visual seeing, observing, and then you can test that it's the fact. So you show me one kind turning into another kind. Now, you know, Darwin observed finches, you know, those little tiny birds? that he saw some on the island that he went to, and then he saw some in a different spot. And in this different spot, they had different beaks. That was evolution. Was that evolution? No. What was it still? It had a different beak, but what was it? It was still a bird. It was still a finch, right? So it didn't change from one kind to another. So this whole video was about that. Show me, and you can't do it. Because Adam looked and there was not anyone else comparable to him. God created humans in his image. We are set apart and above the rest of the creation. Amen. And I praise God for that. And I praise God for the teachings that we find here in Genesis. So... <laughs> Let me ask you a question. I asked this last week as well. Who wrote the book of Genesis? When Moses was writing this down, did he separate it with punctuation and chapters? No. Okay, so when Moses wrote this down, there was no differentiation between chapter 1 and chapter 2. If chapter 2 is a whole other creation, uh, then why does chapter 2 start with the seventh day, the ending of the first? Think about that. On day 6, God makes man, and God creates him. God puts him in the garden. He brings animals to him. Now, let's get back to these animals, okay? What kind of animals did the verse say he brought to him? He brought to him cattle and birds. Okay, now, is that everything that God made? No. Okay, if you go back in chapter 1, it tells you that God made the sea creatures and all the creepy things. And it doesn't tell you here that Adam named them, does it? Now, what was Adam's job? Chapter 2 also tells you that uh, there was no rain on the earth at that time, and there was no man to till, okay, the ground. So God made Adam for a purpose, not just to worship God, but to have a purpose and a job to do. What was that job? To till the ground. He was to work as a farmer, agriculture. So look at these beasts that are brought to him that he named. Those would be beasts that would deal with helping him with 
what his job was. Now he wasn't, as I said last week, he wasn't to eat these things. God didn't bring him the cattle so he could make them into steak. But if Adam wanted to till the ground, what would he use? He would use an ox, cattle, right? So, this helps you understand what's going on because this is one of the verses that critics use to say, this just can't be true. Adam could not have named all the animals in one day. Uh, not only did that happen on that day, what else took place? God said it's not good for man to be alone, and what did he do? He put Adam to sleep, took a rib from him, and created Eve. Okay? And so, like I said last week, the sixth day was a busy, busy day. Amen. Now, how many hours were in that day? 24. So all this happened in that period of time. Okay? So it helps you to understand and explain that when you're dealing with these sets of verses, what actually was going on. Okay? Uh, now, God looks, Adam looks, and Adam's by himself, and God says it's not good for man to be alone. Did that take God by surprise? No. So God, because if you look in verse 1 at the creation, it says plainly that God made them male and female, right? Amen. Chapter 2 gives you a little more detail of that event that took place in those hours of the sixth day. Amen. Okay? And as Ray said, what this was for was to show Adam his need. Not that God was surprised like, Wow, this, this guy can't be left by himself. Well, women, you know that already. <laughs> Is that me? Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure why. Okay. God wanted Adam to see that he needed somebody like him. That to be complete, to show the full image of God, he couldn't do that himself. Now, think about this. The Bible tells you that we were created in whose image? But you can see from this text that Adam couldn't show that image fully and completely in and of himself. He needed a helper. He needed a woman. Okay? And so, God makes the woman. And then, after she wakes up, and Adam closes his mouth... What does God do? Listen, I told you this, that here in the first two chapters, first three chapters of Genesis, every doctrine that you hold to is found here. The foundation of everything you hold fast is found in these first three chapters. So once God wakes the woman up, breathes into her nostrils the breath of life, and introduces her to Adam, what does he do? There you go, he marries them, right? The establishment of the family, of marriage, goes all the way back to the beginning. Amen. And society will show you that if marriage goes downhill, society will follow and go downhill. Right? Yeah. So God brings them together and God marries them. Now how do we know that Genesis 1 and 2 and 3 are true? Well, here's a question for you. Raise your hand, all those who believe that Jesus was sinless and he was the Son of God. Raise your hand. Do you believe that the Bible quotes? I think what that is, Gary, is I'm squeezing on this thing right here. I'm my hand in. This is probably that antenna. Yeah. So, if you believe that Jesus was sinless, he was your Messiah. Do you believe that the words that are contained in Scripture are infallible? Yes. Amen. That was kind of weak. <laughs> you got to actually answer it's either yes or it's no. You can't think, well, maybe, maybe some are, so it's either the whole or it's not. So I, I am making a point here. Now, we're talking about the institution of marriage. We find it here in Genesis chapter 2. Now, if Jesus was to quote from this point in time, would it make this account true? Absolutely. Yes. Okay, so Jesus talked about marriage, and Jesus' own words were that a man would leave his mother and 
cling to his wife, and the two shall become one. All the way back there in Genesis chapter 2. If that is just a fairy tale, if that's just a way to help explain to us where we came from, then Jesus is a liar. And he's not your Messiah. Amen. As I said, it's either right or it's wrong. It's one or it's the other. Okay? And it can't be a mixture of both. Alright, so, after he marries them, and they look around, they see God, they see this beautiful garden that he makes, and then the sun goes down and God has another gift for them. And what is that gift? When does the Sabbath start? Sunday. Evening. Okay, and that's how they accounted days, from evening to evening. Why do you think we start the Sabbath Friday night and it ends Saturday night? So can you imagine what it was like for Adam and Eve, number one, when God breathed into them the breath of life and they opened their eyes, what was the first thing they saw? Jesus' face, leaning over them. Because as soon as he breathed into them the breath of life, their eyes were open. And they see God pulling away from them. And they see this beautiful face. And then they stand up and they look around and they see this beautiful garden. And God is there. And God is talking with them. Now, here's a question for you. Somebody asked me last week about how awesome God is. Did God have to teach Adam how to speak? No. Didn't have to teach him whatever language. Okay? Adam was born with 100% use of his brain from the moment God breathed into him. He was an intelligent creation. Yeah. Now think about some of the questions that he had. Opening his eyes and coming to life. Looking at this God that is light. Living, living light. And you're looking around at the trees, at the animals, and you're realizing... My first question would be, where'd they come from? <laughs> How'd they get here? And God's saying, well, I spoke them into being. I spoke. And Adam was not afraid. Amen. Okay? And Adam asked, well, man, how did I get in? And God said, listen, I spoke them into being, but you I formed with my own two hands. I molded you from the dust of the ground, and then I breathed into you the breath of life. Breathe the Lord. Now, don't you think at some point Adam had to ask, why am I here? Okay? It's a fair question. I'd ask that too. Why am I here? What is my purpose? What do you think God's answer was to him? What would be Adam and Eve's purpose? To glorify God. Think about it. They were made in God's image. What was their purpose? Their purpose was to start this brand new planet, populate it, and have offspring that would glorify God. Amen. And that Adam and Eve had the dominion. They would be let me make sure I phrase this right. They would be the rulers. The, rep the, the better word is representatives. They would be the representatives of this planet. Amen. Now, at some point, Adam and Eve had to see angels, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You think it was before the angel that was sent to guard the way at the entrance yes. of the Garden of Eden? Yes. Absolutely. Okay. Now, at some point, they had to see an angel, and he had to say, wow, what is that? Okay? And God explained to him the whole angelic creation. Because in the process of doing that, he had to explain to him about Satan. Amen. Right? Because the Bible tells you that he told Adam specifically, when he placed him in the garden, that there were two trees there. The garden, or the tree of life, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what did he tell Adam about it? You shall not eat of it, because the day you eat of it, you shall what? 
Surely not. When did that take place? What day? Sixth. Man, that was a busy day. Uh -huh. yeah. Wow. So the sixth day, he tells Adam, here's the tree, don't eat of it. You eat of it, you die. Okay, now. Then it goes into the seventh day. Now this is important to remember this time frame here. Because what we don't know is how long of a time they had from the creation on the sixth day. You know they had the Sabbath, but did she eat the fruit on the eighth day? No. We don't know. The Bible doesn't tell you. But some time has passed, and I'm going to show you how we know that. Okay? What did God say to Adam about the tree? Don't eat it. If you eat of it, you're going to die. Okay? So then the sun goes down and God says, I've got something special for you. Let's go back to our Bibles and let's look at Genesis chapter 2. What does God do on this seventh day? 2 verse 1 says, Thus the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them were what? There was nothing more that God needed to do. It was all done. God had looked around at everything he had made and everything he had made was what? Very good. Very good. Not just good. Every other day he looked and it was good. But at the end he looked and he saw the completed creation. Everything was done and man, it was very good. Nothing in there that he was ashamed that he made. Nothing in there that was a mistake. Meaning that there was nothing in there that would have taken millions of years to straighten out to evolve into what would have been a better thing. Amen? Gary? It was complete. It was perfect. Nothing it, needed to be added. Nothing needed to be added. Okay? And so, verse 2, And on the seventh day God ended His work which He had done, and He, what? Rested. Did He rest because He was wore out? No. no. Man. I would have created an entire universe, and then a world, and then people and animals, I think I might be a little bit tired. But God does not grow weary, nor does He faint. So why did He rest? And it's what Gary said, because everything was complete. There was nothing else that needed to be done. But God wanted to show humanity and give them an example of how they should live their lives. Six days you shall do all of your labor, but on the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. And on that Sabbath day, that seventh day, He rested, and we are to do likewise. Amen. Okay? So, it says in verse... Uh, three. Then God blessed the seventh day, and He did what? Sanctified. Okay. If you look at that word "sanctify," what does it mean? Set apart. To be set apart. So, is there a difference between the seventh day and the other six? Absolutely. Did He sanctify the other six? No. Now I'm preaching to the choir here. I realize that. Okay. But think about this. You guys have heard these things. I've had people say, well, we should treat every day like the Sabbath day. Well, is that what the Bible tells us to do? If you treat it every day like the Sabbath day, nobody would ever go to work and nothing would ever get done. You would starve because you wouldn't feed your family. Okay? So God said, no, six days you do all your what? But on this day I set it apart for you to rest and come and worship Him. Now, when he blessed it, did he bless any of them other days? No. What does it mean when God blesses something? Well, if you guys during prayer time, we seek God's blessing and we seek answers to prayer. We know what blessings mean. That means that God will do something good for us, right? Now, every day is good. Is that right? But listen. God in His infinite wisdom and His infinite love created